Uh, I'm going to be speaking on uh, 2 John. So if you want to turn uh, to the second letter of John. And it's quite amazing actually because um, this message is all about truth and it follows amazingly from what Ian was speaking about last week um, and that's not planned by the way <laughs> and it also follows quite nicely on from the Sunday school as John's writing emphasizes that Jesus is God um, so I think that's, that's an important thing for us to note, that God clearly wants us to know that Jesus is God. He's no one else. He is the Son of God, but he is 100% God at the same time. So uh, Second John was written on a piece of papyrus scroll. And it's quite amazing. Uh, if you've ever seen papyrus scroll, it's from like a plant and they shave it off and they put it together and soak it in water and this makes it really really durable it's also uh, used to make baskets and things like that and it's just it occurred to me that the the amazing uh, provision that God has on his word in that these ancient texts that were written 2,000 years ago are preserved um, <clears throat> So this piece of papyrus scroll, it would have been a small piece like a, like a postcard or like a letter, something like that. And again, it's amazing that it's preserved this amount of time. I don't know about you, but when I receive cards and posts, a week later they're in the bin, to the dismay of my wife. Um, but clearly here, it's been preserved. There's supernatural truth in this letter that is meant for every believer. Back then, it was written around 1995 AD. It's also, there's supernatural truth for us now. And there's supernatural truth for the believers in the future, all the way up until the end of time. <clears throat> so at this point, John is in his 90s. He is probably the last living eyewitness of Jesus Christ at this time. The average age of a man was around 50 years old, and that is why the letter opens, the elder. He doesn't address it as an elder, which would be a term for a pastor of a church. He is the definite elder, the elder. And John, yeah, he was the only one with that title. All of the other apostles had gone. They'd been martyred for their faith. So everyone knew who John was in the early church, the elder. He was the last eyewitness of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's ministry. And he's writing to you and I, and he starts by encouraging us to remain in the truth, not to lose sight, of what we've labored for in this spiritual battle, not to run ahead of the Lord and not to participate with those who are false teachers that are off course, which was going on in the first century, but unfortunately is still going on today and will go on until Jesus' return. So uh, the, another bit of context for you guys, the elect lady that's mentioned a lot throughout the letter um, has debated, divided scholars and is largely debated. Um, some would say that it's an individual woman that John knew and her children. Or some say that he is writing to a group like a church, rem remembering that the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ and would often take a female persona. So it's tough to see who's right or who's wrong. There is no right or wrong it doesn't change the message that's here for us today um, so verse 1 verse 3 verse 5 and verse 13 
they're all in the singular, which would support that he's writing to an individual. For example, verse one says, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. However, verse six, verse eight, verse 10 and verse 12 are written in the plural. For example, verse six, this is the commandment that as you, plural, have heard from the beginning, you, plural, should walk in it. So there's arguments for, for, both, um, for both sides. You could argue that it's written to, in both contexts, to both a singular lady and to uh, the elect church, which I, I think makes sense. During this time, the church wouldn't have been held in a big building like this or in a, an English church or chapel. It would have met in a small believer's home, like a home group. Um, something like that. The idea of the large church is a Western idea. We're very fortunate to be free to worship freely for the time being. And um, at this time, that wasn't the case. In 90 to 95 AD, the church was under huge persecution. Um, <clears throat> the church had just been through the rule of Emperor Nero and at this time was coming into the rulership of Domitian. And these were two really hard people. <laughs> they were really, really anti-Jesus, anti-God. Um, Christians were being slaughtered. By the second century, around six million Christians had been martyred in the Roman Empire. Um, so it could be that John is writing to the elect lady, which is a church, without naming a congregation and her children, i.e. the believers, to protect their identity. Um, it's also a plausible thought as we read at the end of the letter in verse 13, it signs off from the children of your elect sister. Could be a possible uh, congregation from which John was writing. Um, however way you want to look at it, it doesn't change the meaning of the letter. Just some context for you who are interested. And, um, or either way, it is written to the church because we're studying it today, class. So, verse one. To verse three. The, elect, uh, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth, and love. Five times we read the word truth. Truth is clearly a big deal to John. The theme of uh, John's gospel, as I mentioned earlier, is Jesus' deity. And he wanted to emphasize the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. <clears throat> it was John who recorded in his gospel in chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John writes this statement in a tense where it's an emphatic statement. So uh, using the Greek, it, it reads, I, in dis uh, distinction by contrast, to, so in all, to all others, so I, in counter distinction to all others and the way, I, in counter distinction to all others and the truth, and I, in counter distinction to all others and the life. He then goes on, no one has ever come, no one is coming, and no one will ever come to the Father except through me. I'll read that again because I think it's rather cool. Um, so, it reads, I, in distinction by contrast to all others and the way, I, in distinction by contrast to all others and the truth, 
I, in distinction by contrast to all others and the life, no one has ever or is or will ever come to the Father except through me. That is awesome. When I heard about that, I was like, wow. Uh, and it's clear, it's an absolute, an absolute truth. It's a clear, defining statement. In this world, there's too much grey. My wife hates grey. We, we like things simple, black and white. It's a clear statement. We have a clear right and a clear wrong. The right, Jesus Christ, and the wrong, anyone else claiming to be the Messiah. John also writes in his Gospel 17, verse 17 to 19, where Jesus is praying to his disciples. He writes, sanctify them by your, that's God the Father, truth, sanctify them by your truth, your word, that's God's word, is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus doesn't say your word is true, even though it is true. Jesus says your word is truth. And we have it in our hands or on our phones. However you want to have your Bible, God's word is truth. And that's such an assuring thing to have in this murky world of morality that we're living in. John also writes, chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The truth embodied itself in Jesus Christ. This is awesome because the world is bonkers at the moment and it will keep on becoming bonkers. All we need, the real truth, is that Jesus came, Jesus died for our sins, Jesus rose again, and is coming back in full power and glory. Listen, if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you're in a bit of a rough place, know that truth, that Jesus came, Jesus died, for you and I, he rose again and is coming back. And if you're here this morning or listening online and you haven't given your life to Jesus, please do so. There's no time like now. Anchor your life to the absolute that we have. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we're reading through John's writings, whether it be in the Gospels, or whether it be in his epistles or revelation, he is clearly writing about truth. In verse 2, he addresses the reader, whom I love in truth. Truth is clearly on John's heart. And he continues, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be us forever. And that word abides means dwell, it's dwelleth, um, and it's a continual dwelling. It's written in the present tense. So it's like a permanent dwell. It's in your gut, it's in your heart. Um, <clears throat> and then notice we have a colon after the word forever. The sentence isn't finished. Verse three, grace, mercy, and peace be with you or shall be with you from God the Father and from G Lord Jesus Christ. And I find that comma really interesting, not the comma, the colon. <clears throat> um, we, we live in a time where anxiety is at its peak. I, I work in secondary school and especially post-COVID, mental health has become a real issue. Um, and we're trying to find ways to, to help people and navigate through mental health issues. And John tells us right here, let the truth dwell in you. And therefore, the colon, grace, mercy, and peace be with you. I know some cases it's not that simple and there are people who have some, some uh, issues, but it's a, it's a really good place to start. Anchor that truth, let the, 12, uh, let the truth dwell in you like permanently, continually, 
and it will be with you forever. It's a good place to start. Uh, the second half of verse 3, we read the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. Um, <clears throat> it's the only place in the Old Testament where you would read that phrase, the Lord Jesus, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. This is clearly to emphasize Jesus as the Son of the Father. Um, remember, John was writing in 1995 AD. There were heresies that were growing within the church. At this time, particularly, you had the Gnostics and a growing teaching from a philosopher called Serinthus that denied that Jesus was God. They said Jesus was like a spiritual being. He wasn't fully man. He came, but he wasn't a man, because how can you mix deity and flesh? That, and that's, that's what they were writing. So clearly, John wrote his gospel and these letters in response to this. Jesus is God, but he also came as man. And nowadays, as well as back then, it's a stumbling block for other religions and atheists. You, you would say, how can God have a son? And, of course, us natural minds cannot comprehend this. So I do sympathise a little bit, but of course it's supernatural. They may also say, how can there be a virgin birth? How can someone be raised from the dead who died three days ago? It is crazy, if you think of it scientifically or logically. But yes, we believe it because we have faith. It takes faith to believe what the Bible says and to say it's real. Here at Calvary Chapel, we believe that the Bible is inerrant, so it's without error. So when it says here in black and white that Jesus Christ is Son of the Father, we believe it to be true. It's, it's our hope. It's our hope in this hopeless world. Because if that's not true, our salvation is a lie. Our eternal truth our eternal life, rather, is based on this truth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Understand here, John is writing that there is a truth that you have, and it needs to be settled in your gut and in your heart. Grace, mercy, peace be with you from your heavenly Father in times of hardship. Let it dwell in you. Let, it, let that truth settle in your stomach. Verse 4, I rejoiced, greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. So John moves on after uh, detailing what truth is and, and what we have and he moves on to talk about how we need to walk in the truth. So it's not just something we need to know, we need to walk in it, it's something for us to do. Walking is a, is a doing word. John rejoices greatly to find the children walking in the truth, like we have here in verse 4. Whether it's a lady and her children, or a church and its congregation, John is greatly pleased. This could also be taken as an exhortation to parents that it's our responsibility to teach our kids to walk in the truth. Uh, Solomon details in Proverbs 4, he talks about legacy and essentially says, son, I'm telling you what my father told me. It goes down the generations, okay? And um, our children are likely to be parents to their children and so on and so on. So the things that we, uh, that we share with our children they go down the generations. They have the potential to reach multiple people. It's important. Joel, it's written in Joel. It starts chapter 1, verse 3. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. And here, John is saying he greatly rejoices in the work that's going on in this church or in this family. He greatly rejoices to find these children walking in truth as received commandment from the Father. Good job, elect lady. Good job. 
they're walking in it, they're progressing, they're actively moving forward. Verse 5, and now I plead with you, lady, not as though I write a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have, had, you have heard from the beginning, and you should walk in it. Here John is referencing um, John 13, 34 to 35, where Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. And if, and if you have, and if you have love for one another. <clears throat> Verse 6. This is love, that we walk according with his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning, and you should walk in it. It's, it's practical. It's walking. Walk in it. John says, and he greatly rejoices in it. It's not just a concept for these believers. John is emphasizing the walking aspect of the commandment. Um, I can imagine he's doing this maybe because there are groups of believers that they're sitting around and they're theorizing love. And they're talking about, oh, maybe we should do this and it means that and it means that. But that's not particularly edifying the body if there isn't an action, a walking in the love and the truth. Or on the other side, there may be a situation where you have believers in a group and they're theorizing love and they're, they're kind of walking in it, but then they go away and they do the opposite. And that's, that's clearly not good. Our conduct is a witness. More people are going to read you than they are the Bible. They're going to read you they're not going to go into Waterstones or W. H. Smiths and open up John 1. They're going to read you and how you are. So let your conduct, let us be salt and light and be an example to those outside. And John is saying he greatly rejoices in this um, group that actively supporting one another. It's such a blessing when I hear of um, folk in this congregation supporting one another and helping one another. Um, it's such an encouragement to me and I'm sure it's an encouragement to everyone else to hear of those amazing things where we're serving one another, we're praying with one another, we're having fellowship during hardship. And it's the reason why the church is spoken of as a unified body. One family, when one grieves, they all grieve. And it's why it's so important to be active in a fellowship or a church. Life is hard. It's not meant to be taken on alone. We need Jesus and we also need one another. So John has outlined the truth that we have in Jesus Christ in verses 1 to 6. And he has highlighted the importance of loving one another in a practical way, using Jesus' sacrificial example. In light of these things, John moves on. To verse 7, part 2. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we, uh, we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. So verse 7, let's unpack it a little bit. When John speaks of Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh in his Gospels and his epistles, like here, Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, he is writing in the present tense. He's speaking of the incarnation. Or as Paul puts it in Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God with us, Emmanuel. He is a man, but also God. And he is coming back as a man and as God in the flesh. Um, and he says, those who do not hold to that truth are deceivers and antichrists. 
Now, John is the only writer who uses the term antichrist. It's in his gospel, it's in his epistles, and it's in Revelation. So the term anti, <coughs> either, it, it means either, it means against, or it means instead of. Uh, here, because it's in the plural, uh, he's speaking of an antichrist, not the antichrist, okay? Uh, so when he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, he's not speaking of the antichrist that we hear of in Revelation, he's speaking of like the spirit of people against God. Um, luckily, we're, we're not in those days where we are, have the instead of Christ, that the antichrist, but we are living in a secular society and it's hard it's hard you'll you'll come across things people challenging you because they're coming from a secular world they come and saying, really do you really believe god came into the flesh and he died and rose again really yes we do our salvation is pinned on it hold fast to that truth in verse 8 he says look to yourselves that we do not lose things we worked for but that we may receive a full reward the term look to yourselves is like a continual watch continual check keep your eyes open and hold fast to the truth that john has been speaking of that we do not lose those things we have worked for but that we may receive a full reward John isn't speaking of salvation here when he says we don't lose the things that we worked for because we don't work for salvation. So if you took that into context, it doesn't make sense. We don't work for salvation. So John isn't speaking about losing salvation. Salvation is a free gift and once it's obtained, it cannot be taken away. Just like Noah and the ark. What John is speaking of here is He's speaking of rewards in heaven. So what he's saying here is, be alert to the things around you, making sure we're walking in the truth. What are we doing here? What are we doing with the time that we have on this earth? It's such a small amount of time compared to eternity. He wants us to live with eternal lenses on. I have glasses. But even those with 2020 vision have your eternal lenses in keep your eyes on the prize verse 9 whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of christ does not have god he who abides in the doctrine of christ has both the father and the son so the term transgresses is an interesting word here it actually means to run ahead so whoever runs ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Um, in essence, he's saying, or he's speaking of people here who negatively view doctrine. People who might be trying to be progressive in uh, the things that they believe and teach. Uh, they might come to you and say, doctrine, that's a bit of a divisive thing, isn't it? That's a negative thing. They might say, the Bible's outdated, it's out of context, we don't need those things, you know, it's meant for a different time. What do you mean there's only one way to, re to heaven? And that's coming from someone who actually may believe in like a physical afterlife rather than some spiritual enlightenment that comes in this life. Doctrine is not a scary word, it just means a set of beliefs. The doctrine of Jesus Christ cannot be separated from Jesus Christ. They are one. If you choose to go against the doctrine of Christ, choose to not abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. It's there. It's, I don't think John can be any clearer. The good news is, is we have a next sentence. And that sentence reads, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Amazing. Um, some of you may, have, may know the acronym KISS. 
I'm not talking about the rock band with the face paint. Um, Kiss, keep it simple, stupid. The Bible is the word of God. It doesn't need modifying. You don't need to add to it. You don't need to take anything away, especially not by us and our moral compass, even though it's not really a compass anymore. It's like a, yeah. It would change every day, wouldn't it, really? The word of God is perfect. It doesn't need to be added to or taken away. We have it. Keep it simple, stupid. Verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Now this isn't saying don't let non-believers in your house. It's not. It's great to be hospitable to non-Christian friends and non-Christian family. Um, It gives you a chance to chat to them about Christ. It gives you a chance to evangelize. Someone is more likely to come to church having had a chat with you over like dinner, lunch, um, than, than anything else really. So this isn't saying don't let non-believers in your house. It's speaking of someone coming into your home or church with the intention of being antichrist, with that spirit of antichrist, with anti-Jesus. So imagine this picture. Uh, a clear antichrist comes to your house you see them through the window and okay they've got some sort of slogan on their car or something like that Um, and they they come to your door and as a good loving Christian you want to invite them in your home nothing wrong with that right and you you have some time and then they they leave and you say oh great chat Um, great to see you God bless you But then in the corner of your eye, as you walk, as you see them go off and you look across the road, you see that neighbor who's umming and ahhing about Christ. Because you had a chat with them the week before about who Jesus is and how amazing it is to be a Christian. But then he or she has just seen you mix with someone who's obviously dodgy. So that's the warning here that John says do not let them into your home you don't you want to be careful with who you're associating yourself with it's not saying don't evangelize to lost lambs hebrews 13 starts by saying let brotherly love continue do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels It's just a warning from John to be careful of who you associate yourself with and who you let into your home. If they come to you saying Jesus Christ is not God in human flesh, don't let them in. That's what it's saying. Um, I remember for our marriage prep, we had uh, Tony Holliday, who's coming to speak in a few weeks' time. He said to me, your house is like your Eden. Genesis 2, 15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The word tend is to labor, but not in a hard way because labor wasn't difficult before the fall. It's more of like an enjoying being in your home, enjoying working on it. Um, That's the word tend, and to keep is to protect or to keep guard. This is the approach we should have for our homes. Whether you're single or you are married, make sure that if you see a wolf or a snake coming for you, don't let them in, figuratively or hypothetically, or metaphorically. Um, So verse 12, having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. I imagine at this time John is struggling with his writing at 90 years old, so he's keeping his letters short here, but he says he can't wait 
to be face to face with the people reading these letters. I mean, how amazing will it be to be face to face with John? You can ask him all the stories. You know, what was it like when Peter got out of the boat? What was it like on resurrection morning? What was it like when the Holy Spirit descended and the church was born? We have eternity to look forward to those things, talking to John, talking to the apostles, and all these amazing things. Uh, And it's going to be awesome. Can't wait. Um, So, in closing, um, we live in a crazy world, but we have the truth. Allow that truth to settle in our hearts, in our guts, and continually make sure it's there. We're all works in progress, and we're trying to be like Christ every day, walking in the truth. In doing these things, we should look out. We want to build everyone up in the church. We want to edify people, but unfortunately, there are those who want to tear it down. We need to be watchful of those take guard to those who don't want to confess that Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. They will try and deceive you and people. Keep your eyes open, keep those eternal lenses on and be aware not to run ahead, not to transgress, uh, run ahead of God's word. John ends. Oh, I've ended, apparently. (laughs) John ends verse 13 it's a lovely simple ending from the children of your elect sister greet you so this is in my view likely to be a congregation that John is writing from at the time they're holding their church their brotherly church their brothers in Christ in prayer and edifying with teaching it's a lovely lovely model so it's really important that we pray for our church but the other churches around us We are one church. We're united in the truth. That's a wonderful picture. Um, Yeah, well, Father God, thank you so much for your word. And I pray that we would have taken these words and this letter and live by them and make sure that our truth, that truth that that you've given us is in our hearts. Amen.